Hi, my name is Ian Yi. I'm an investigative journalist and also co-founder of a media company called The Fork. We do investigative journalism uh, to fight social injustice, and uh, we're starting to do training programs for other young people as well to, to, to help them follow that same journey. I started out in a very different field in journalism, where I was I was a lifestyle and entertainment reporter for the longest time. <gasps> I didn't know that. Yes, I did all the fun stuff, got it all out of my system. I've interviewed like the biggest stars in the world, and it was a lot of fun. Um, but then, you know, it, it all felt a bit meaningless. And I had editors who kept pushing me and said, "Ian, you could do so much more." So I so and you know they insisted I try bigger stories, more hard hitting stuff. And eventually, when it was my turn to become editor, I I, I took the best parts of that and uh, decided to go full out investigative. And I had some great colleagues with me who, who proposed that as well, who fought for that as well, to take it even to a further level. Uh, so that's how we got into it. And honestly, why we do it is, I think once you've done one investigation, you see not just the impact of what that investigation can, can do to the people whose stories you're telling, um, but once you see the impact that it can have on society, it's, uh, and how it can help, really help people on the ground, I think that's something that's hard to turn away from. Can you give an example, Ian? Like, and was there that story for you? Yeah. So I think one of it was when we were doing an investigation on a human trafficking network that was bringing in Bangladeshi students to Malaysia. So what they would do is they would take advantage of the fact that there's this huge demand for education in Bangladesh, right? And it's a, they market it as an opportunity to break out the property cycle. So a lot of these parents save lots of money, sell land, sell cattle, take loans, in some cases with loan sharks, to pay for their child to come to Malaysia for what they believe is going to be a life-changing education mm. or degree. And when they get here, it turns out the university is bogus, and they get sent off to a construction site. And there's very little avenue for redress or recourse for them. Uh, the system is just not built in a way that, that helps them. So many of them end up there uh, for five, six, seven years, and uh, just trying to get out of that debt bondage and to buy a ticket home. So I was privileged enough to speak to some of them. So we went to the streets, we went to the to workers' living quarters. Um, Can I stop you there? Sure. Privileged enough to get to speak to these? Yes. Or brave enough? No, I think it really is a privilege what we do. We get to tell other people's stories. We get to earn their trust, to be trusted with that story because, and this is something I tell a lot of my the younger journalists that I work with is, they're not just trusting you with their stories, they're trusting you with their lives. Um, so we have to, we have to earn that trust, right? That, right? That's a privilege for us to be able to hear their stories um, that they haven't told probably anyone else in the world, but they're telling us, they're entrusting us with it. If we don't treat it with care, that story, it could get them arrested, it could get them deported, it could get them detained, and, um, and they will never get out of that debt bondage and their families are ruined for maybe another generation. So I feel it's a privilege to be able to hear those stories and to, to, to share them. It's a sacred yeah. trust. Yeah, it is. Actually. But to get there, to find their stories, does require a level of courage. Yeah, yeah. And, and what do you have to confront to be able to sit with someone who then will have to have the courage to share. So I think in this sense, the courage wasn't so much on my part, but I work with some really great investigative journalists, really brave young people, the ones that, so I got to speak to the survivors of this trafficking, right? So like this, this young man that I met, 24 years old, has been in Malaysia for four years, has not seen his family for the entire time. And the thing that really struck me that he told me was that he didn't have the heart to tell his family that he had been trafficked. He's been telling his family the whole time that he is still doing his degree. Don't worry about me. I will graduate. I'll come back. And that's why I, I think one of the reasons why we keep doing it. Because when you hear a story like that, you can't walk away. You know, it's it's just it's painful and difficult. But my other journalists, my producers, um, if I can name drop them, if you're listening, like people like Elroy or uh, Sean or Samantha, they they go undercover. People like Clarissa and all that. Yeah, all of you, you know who you are. Um, so brave. They actually met with the human trafficker itself. They actually set up a sting operation. They went through a lot of painstaking work, months and months of work, 
just to have that one hour meeting with that guy. And then after that, months and months of uncertainty about how the case will unfold, and many years of, of fear, maybe. You know, potential risk is there even as much as we mitigate against that risk. We plan and plan and plan. You'll never know really, in a split second what's going to happen. So that's, that's true courage for me. When you're an investigative journalist, and you're doing a sting operation with a trafficker. Is there a role for moral imagination to see the humanity in that trafficker? Yeah. And how do you think about that? It's something that one of my producers actually always talked about that I learned from him, uh, Elva. He was saying as well, like, we can't wait to stop painting this as a good versus evil situation. Even the trafficker, what's his story? Even people who are he did another piece on, I think, I think it was the deforestation one where these indigenous peoples were being, you know, their sacred land, their ancestral land was being destroyed because of logging activities. Um, so he's always saying we, we can't keep painting this antagonistic relationship between all these different stakeholders or players. Um, we need to take a more measured approach. Um, yeah, and, and it was later on that when I came to the fellowship that I learned, wow, you guys have... This is exactly what he was talking about. A lot of things about holding tension in different values and, and things like that. It was being intuitively done uh, in, in our team, in our reporting, because of people like that in the team who were raising these issues and trying to, trying to find a better way to tell the story. So it's very easy to be more dramatic, to paint these people, these traffickers, loggers, drug, uh, drug syndicate leaders as these dark, uh, demonic figures, um, it's easy. You get more hits, you get more video views, uh, and people tend to glorify, yes. you know, oh, well done, journalist, you went after this big, big bad person. But we try not to do that as far as we can. And we also highlight that a lot of them end up in this position because of social inequality. Uh, a lot of them end up in this position because maybe they had debts or maybe they had a family member who fell ill and the only way to get help for them was a life of crime. So we try to think about that as well. And so even holding that, even recognizing that this is a failed system where you've got completely desperate, vulnerable people who are being trafficked by people who themselves may have vulnerabilities but have moved to the dark. Um, how, how did your work in investigative journalism um, create change in this one particular story? Yeah, so what we do is a bit different from a lot of other media companies. So we do what we, we've, we've come to term it uh, as impact journalism, impact, or invest, impact and investigative journalism. So we don't just expose the issue. We also try to figure out some solutions and uh, public action campaigns to get people to to support it, to mobilize people to create change. So for example, in this case, in this particular, what we call student trafficking case, um, we asked the public to support new regulations on how student visas are approved. So these are really practical, uh, one small step type of solutions that we can go for. Um, of course, there's um, uh, much broader problems, right? There's problems with the immigration system itself. There's problems with corruption, um, huge, huge problems. But we figured we always try to go for that one, one small step. So we figured it would be the student visa system. So just three simple changes would stop this form of trafficking. Wow. Yeah. So we figured it out with some NGOs, with our activist friends. We went to the Ministry of Higher Education and said, you know, what do you think of these solutions? Uh, and we were finessed it with them. And so when we launched that that piece, we actually launched it together with that impact campaign with the support of the Ministry of Higher Education. And it worked. Uh, it's a crazy story, it worked. Um, the, the Bangladeshi um, our partners in, in Bangladesh, uh, Daily Star, thank you all so much. Uh, so it's a newspaper, it's I think the largest English newspaper. I know it, newspaper. I know yeah. it. So, so they were monitoring things from, from, for us on, in, in Dhaka and um, they told us, and, and some of our activists friends that were there told us that, well, you know, it stopped. They've stopped sending people to Malaysia. Unfortunately, they probably will find different routes, sending, sending them to different countries, but at least to Malaysia, it stopped for that one year. And 
hopefully it's, it still hasn't picked up. What gives you a sense of despair right now? And is there a counter where you feel a real sense of hope? I think, I think the way the world is going in terms of disinformation, that doesn't seem like it's gonna end soon. Mm. The way media, which is something that I've spent my whole life in, in the industry, uh, that industry is being used to you know, erode democracies. So on the flip side, what gives me hope is the, the, the amazing courage of all these journalists. And again, we in Malaysia, we are so privileged as journalists. We don't face a lot of physical threats. You know, there's the odd legal threat, there's the cyber attacks. It's fine. I mean, it's not fine. <laughs> it's, it's terrible when it happens to you. Uh, we've had it, it's, and it's awful. But uh, journalists in India were being killed. Yeah. In Indonesia. Uh, in, in many parts of the world. In many parts of the world. In the Philippines, uh, they're, they're still putting some bogus charges on Maria Ressa, which is probably the best case, the most well-known case. Um, but all around the world, in Russia, wherever else there is. Um, so I think they are the ones that give me hope, that they are st st still standing firm, they're still holding the line. And uh, I just hope that more people realize that this is an existential crisis that they're holding the line against. And more people will give them that support and that that uh, that, that push to, to push back mm. against that tide of disinformation. Ian, I am so honored and talk about feel privileged that you're part of um, Acumen Academy and this whole family, really. I think you have so much to teach. And I do think that um, this model of identifying problems and coming forth with solutions, such a powerful role for the fourth estate.